private sector leaders. So as the world seeks to fight poverty and respect fundamental human rights, girls remain nearly invisible to those in positions of power. And yet it is only through major and sustained improvements in the condition of girls that the world will reach its goals. Beyond economic outcomes, improved governments and healthy societies depend on an active and engaged citizenship. A thriving civil society comes not only from increased aspects of political awareness and social awareness, but also from the average citizen's participation in all aspects of political life. Girls as well as boys must be adequately educated and trained to prepare them for later economic and civic life, and young women must be given adequate opportunities to contribute and to participate in this public life for change to take hold. It is critical that girls' contributions remain productive. Girls' welfare today sh shapes the prospects for future families. It should be so obvious that the health and education and the achievement of future generations is directly related to the physical and intellectual condition of today's girls and young women who will bear and prepare the children of the next decade. Most importantly, girls matter because they're human beings. Girls have equal rights to human dignity, self-determination, freedom and violence, good health from violence, good health, education, and participation in economic and political life. And we're failing. Although a precious asset for the present and future, girls in developing countries are in trouble. Girls and young women are generally less educated, less healthy, less free than their male peers. They face systematic disadvantages over a wide range of welfare. Indicators including health, education, nutrition, labor force participation, and the burden of household tasks. Because of deprivation and discriminatory cultural norms, many girls are forced to marry at very young ages and are extraordinarily vulnerable to HIV, sexual violence, and physical exploitation. Lacking a full range of economic opportunities and devalued because of the gender bias, many girls are seen as unworthy of investment even when it comes to food, and which is fed to the boys instead of the girls, the protein, or even for protection by their families. Isolated and unsupported, these girls have little voice to demand their rights, and as they move into marriage, early marriage and childbearing, the cycle continues. The poorest and least developed countries tend to have the largest shares of young people in their populations, and it is the girls and young women who face the greatest disadvantage. A sixth of the world young people live on less than $2 a day, including 12 million girls in sub-Saharan Africa who live on less than a dollar a day. Few poor girls have an opportunity for education in sub-Saharan Africa. For example, only 17% of girls enroll in secondary school. Girls bear a heavy burden of the work, particularly in rural areas where they carry the water, collect the firewood, care for the young, and tend to the livestock. One girl in seven in developing countries marries before the age of 15, and nearly half of all girls in the poorest nations marry before 18. The next set of observations some might feel are too disturbing, but that is precisely why they must be discussed. Early childbearing is closely correlated with poverty. Girls from poor households are three times more likely than better off girls to give birth during adolescence, and they bear twice as many children. Nearly half of sexual assaults worldwide are against girls ages 15 and younger. And girls as age 15 to 19 in developing countries are also at a particularly high risk for physical and sexual violence. During adolescence, many of these young women may also be subjected to female genitalia cutting, forced marriage, sexual exploitation, and discriminatory property and family laws. Around 59% of HIV positive adults in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is the worst affected region in the world still, are women, and 75% of infected youths are girls age 15 to 24. In many places, HIV infection, ironically, is higher amongst married girls than their unmarried counterparts. Unwanted pregnancies are disproportionately disproportionate among young unmarried girls who often lack access to contraception procedures and carry a high risk of death. In Ethiopia, more than half of the maternal deaths among women under age 20 were found to be due to abortion. One quarter to one half of girls in developing countries become mothers before age 18, and 14 million girls ages 15 to 19 give birth each year. Adolescent girls are up to five times more likely to die from complications 
of pregnancy than women in their 20s, and their babies are also at a much higher risk of death. The highest fertility, fertility rates, of course, are then also amongst the adolescents in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, where more than 90% of the maternal deaths occur. By virtue of their age and social position, girls' opportunities and prospects are fundamentally shaped by those closest to them, particularly family members, mothers, fathers, other male relatives, mother-in-laws, husbands. But the actions within the often hidden domestic circle are affected by the policies and resource allocation of national and local governments, donor agencies, as well as by civil society and the private sector. We can all help. The cycle of neglect of girls' rights, poor health, education indicators, meager economic options, and the gener generation to generation transmission of poverty can be broken by focused investments in girl-directed policies and programs that meet girls' needs. So let's talk just for a moment about a few concrete statistics that demonstrate the magnitude of the economic effect of the girl. I promise only a few more statistics. According to our World Bank research on the economic impact of educating girls, if an Ethiopian girl, if Ethiopian girls all finish secondary school, they'd add 6.8 billion to Ethiopian GDP over their lifetime. If all the girls in Kenya completed secondary school, they'd add 27 billion to Kenyan GDP. If Bangladesh, in, if all the girls finish secondary school, they'd add 22 billion to Bangladeshi GDP. The four million adolescent mothers in India cost the Indian economy 383 billion over their lifetime. If young Nigerian women had the same employment rates as young Nigerian men, they would add another 13.9 billion in annual GDP. The numbers are pretty staggering. Over the entire 14 country study, adding one level to the average girl's education would raise the, the uh, country GDP by 1.5% per year. There are 600 million girls ages 10 to 18 in the developing world. Of the 130 million out of school youths in the developing world, 70% are girls. Each additional year of primary school adds 10 to 20% to the wages of a girl in the developing world. Each additional year of secondary school adds 15 to 25% to the wages of the girl in the developing world. And I love this statistic, so I'm gonna repeat it again later. When a woman in the developing world earns income, she spends 90% of it on her family, whilst a man in the same world spends only 30-40% of his income on his family. Which brings me to a program and some good news, is that there are some solutions to these problems. Educate girl, glo girls globally. And more good news, we can start with another short video. such as female toilets. By improving the quality of education 
and creating girl-friendly environments. Communities can begin to see school as a worthwhile and accessible place for their girls. FBGG enriches the learning experience in government schools by introducing creative learning techniques. Teachers are trained to create more inclusive, supportive and engaging learning environments for their students. Regular pre and post tests clearly show the effectiveness of these teaching methods. Life skills games are introduced to Balsabar Girl Councils to develop confidence, self-awareness 